In the realm of natural wonders and corporate mysteries, nothing is more intriguing and enthralling than Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. This extraordinary geobiological phenomena has, over time, emerged as one of the United States' largest national parks, a formidable rival to the iconic Yellowstone and Grand Canyon. However, its ascent ended just as quickly as it began. To understand why, we need to delve further into the remarkable transformation of Anodyne Incorporated, a once modest mining entity into a global corporate colossus. We need to understand why the park was so popular, and most importantly, we need to understand what happened that hot July night in 2007 during the incident that led to over 750 deaths, thousands of injuries, and the permanent closure of the national park. Howdy folks, my name is Speaker Four, and welcome to Unraveling Mystery Flesh Pit National Park 15 years later. Before we can even begin to discuss the tragic incident that took place the night of July 4th, 2007, we need to make sure everyone's on the same page. So, what exactly is Mystery Flesh Pit National Park? Truthfully, the story of the pit starts millions of years ago, when the colossal organism, also known as Imanus Colossius, settled into the pit it's resided in for centuries. But for human purposes, the story starts in the 1970s, when exploratory oil drillers stumbled upon something strange and practically otherworldly. Dale Whitmer and his team were drilling a well near Odessa, Texas, when they struck a strange material they didn't recognize, at least until the auger came back covered in a red fluid. Blood, as far as they could tell. It was short work for them to track down a cave, more of a pit really, filled to the brim with a warm, flesh-like deposit. Dale Whitmer immediately called for a geologist, and Jim Jackson answered the call. Often called the guru of the underground for his work with petroleum deposits, Jim Jackson led the exploration of what they quickly realized was a mass of flesh, a living, breathing organism that extends hundreds if not thousands of feet underground. Amazing. He called it in a letter to his business partner. This thing breathes and makes sounds just the same as any other creature, and it bleeds. God, how it bleeds. It's a mess out here. Some of the workers he brought with him thought it might have been a creature from outer space. Others called it Diablo de Bajo, or the devil beneath. Jim didn't particularly care about the pit's origins. He only wanted to profit off of it. He spared no expense, hiring cave explorers, excavators, and crews of workers. Jim Jackson and his team began exploring the pit. According to their accounts, it was strange, otherworldly, and filled with creatures like never seen before. They mapped the pit, explored it with scuba gear and caving gear, and carved out safe spaces and rest points in order to venture deeper and deeper. As far as these first explorers could tell, the pit extended limitlessly into the depths of the world. And it was dangerous too. The creatures inside were hostile and the conditions were much the same. In the first month of exploration, three of the hired workers had died already but that was just a taste of what the pit could do. Once they were mostly settled, Jim took the first round of sightseers and reporters down into the pit. At this point, the organism had been rigged with walkways, gas generators, and light systems. The tourists were amazed and horrified in equal measure. Thousands of meters deep and three miles down into cavernous organs of the superorganism was a world unlike any they had ever seen before. A reporter with his first round of visitors described it as an excursion of wonder and terror, nightmare realms and ghostly monsters, giant arteries, skyscraper muscles, and pits of hell. Despite the horror and danger, the visitors were transfixed, and Jim Jackson knew he had something special on his hands, not just for tourism, but also for the strange materials found inside the mystery flesh pit. The problem was that nobody knew exactly what this mystery pit was, what it ate, or how long it's been there. According to Jim, they needed some guys with real smarts down there, not just oil men. So he called a company down in Fort Worth, Texas to help with the exploration, which is where Anodyne Mining Company enters the fray. The Mystery Flesh Pit, officially known as the Permian Basin Superorganism, was purchased by Anodyne Inc. in 1973. They immediately set up a compound, fenced off the area, and began exploring. It was at this time that the first maps of the pit were drawn and steel infrastructure was sunk into the pit's living walls. Signage from the time even points to possible religious rituals happening in the pit, as well as intensive scientific research. 
By 1976, Anodyne had opened the pit to the general public. The mystery flesh pit was accompanied by restaurants, gift shops, lodging, and was quickly inundated with crowds of tourists desperate to see this never-before-seen massive creature practically living in their backyard. It's really no great surprise that it was so popular. Not only do people love a spectacle, the facilities were also state-of-the-art. There was massive infrastructure built into the pit, all catering to park visitors. Things like a visitor center that hung suspended in the mall, catwalks and trails for hikers, and attraction after attraction of strange biological phenomena for visitors to gawk at. It was so popular, in fact, that by April of 1980, President Jimmy Carter annexed the flesh pit into the national park system, officially making it Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. Anodyne continued mining operations and management of the site, but all the branding and signage was swapped to the National Park Service style. And the Mystery Flesh Pit quickly became one of the most popular national parks out there. By the mid-1990s, it was rivaling tourist destinations like SeaWorld and the Magic Kingdom for a number of park visitors. The Mystery Flesh Pit National Park operated for nearly 30 years until it was closed in 2007, after the incident that resulted in hundreds of deaths. It remains closed to the public to this day. But why was the pit so fascinating? Why were tourists so desperate to see this massive organism beneath the Texas dirt that they lined up by the thousands? Humans, Americans especially, have always been drawn to strange attractions, ever since the eras of circus madhouses and P.T. Barnum's Freak Show. And frankly, there's nothing stranger than the Permian Basin superorganism. The main draw, however, was the flesh pit's size. Which brings us to the biology of the pit, a study known as Venterio Biology. What cannot and should not be understated is the size of the mystery flesh pit. The flesh of the pit stretches over 120 square kilometers beneath the Permian Basin in West Texas. Even if the superorganism was above the ground, if you stood on one side of the pit's reach, you wouldn't be able to see the other. In fact, it stretches 25 times further than the human eye can see. And it's not just some amorphous mass of living, breathing flesh. Venteriologists describe its lateral anatomy as a mantle sitting above 15 symmetric limbs. For those of you confused, the closest terrestrial analog would be a giant starfish. Unlike a starfish, however, the vast majority of the flesh pit's mass lies beneath it. Anodyne's mining operations and government-funded research expeditions have reached over 19,000 meters down with no sign of stopping. Geologists estimate that part of the superorganism might even be lodged in the Earth's mantle a full 50 kilometers deeper than the furthest reaches explored. The mystery flesh pit is literally unimaginably huge. You and I have no frame of reference for an organism this big. It's so big that every time it moves, and it does move, the resulting earthquake stretches as far as Dallas, Texas, nearly 350 miles away. It's large enough that people can walk through its veins and organs, the National Park is a popular hiking destination. There's forests such as the bronchial forests that provide fresh air to the pit, and lakes like the gastric lakes that hold digestive fluids. Like any organism of sufficient size, an ecosystem of flora and fauna has sprung up around and inside the mystery flesh pit. Much like the organisms that live symbiotically with whales, mystery flesh pit has its own hangers on, and they are just as strange and alien as the pit itself. Some were creatures mutated and warped by evolution from living generations inside the pit, and others are endemic to it. These strange creatures occasionally come into contact with park goers, so the National Park Service has released brochures telling people what to look out for. Some of these are the macrobacteria, or giant versions of their microscopic counterparts. They range in size from small animals to 12 feet across, and are the most common form of park wildlife for visitors to encounter. For the most part, they're relatively passive in nature, but they have been documented as aggressively territorial. As arguably normal as the macrobacteria are, the rest of the pit's inhabitants are much more strange. And their names, too, are just as odd. There's the amorphous shame, the gastric bristle worm, the ballast siren, the shrieking cloister pod, the venomous shamble, and the aquifer leech. But what is most likely the most dangerous of park wildlife is the abyssal copepod. As their name suggests, the abyssal copepods live in the deeper areas of the flesh pit, and unlike most other pit wildlife, are inherently predatory in nature. And their biology reflects this. Hard chitinous shells coat these arthropods, allowing them to slip through the pit and remain protected from conventional firearms. That's right, they're partially bulletproof, and they're also about 12 feet long and have human-like hands, and most concerningly, are inherently hunters. 
They are considered hazardous to the safety and well-being of park visitors and staff, and park rangers carry firearms to deal with any that come into the light. While the abyssal copepod is certainly the most dangerous, it is not the most horrifying thing to come out of the pit. That dubious honor belongs to the amalgamations or compound surface fauna. These anatomical amalgamations are perhaps one of the most horrifying aspects of the mystery flesh pit, and are a great example of how it's inherently caustic to living creatures. Direct contact with the pit's digestive fluids results in a near instant liquefaction and recombination of biological matter, in most cases still living. This process is not understood by scientists, but results in compound hybrid organisms. Whether they are dragged into the pit by wildlife, have fallen, or have simply lost their way, these creatures become writhing masses of flesh, still alive, in pain, and wretched. Most don't live past a few days, and it's official park stance not to prolong their suffering. As unsettling as these amalgamations are, the true horror is the human amalgamation. People exposed to pit fluids can also become these amalgamated horrors. One major example is a group of performers who accidentally fell into a digestive sac in 1976 and were eventually calcified into a mineral deposit known as the Circus Clown Chymus. While treatments for human amalgamations did exist, they were costly, and in most cases unable to return the compounded persons to their former states. If they could not be retrieved from the pit, amalgamations would languish there until they starved to death or pit exposure killed them. This is likely the fate of some of the 750 who died on July 4th, 2007. No one is more familiar with the hostile nature of the pit than the anodyne miners who have spent more time inside than anyone else. Mining crews made up of 18 men are inside the pit for months at a time, searching for valuable minerals such as oscurolite, amniotic ballast, and corpusite. It is difficult and inhospitable to be in the pit. According to one miner, you have to cut, trudge, push, and crawl through miles and miles of muscle and guts and cartilage and bone that are fighting you the whole way. To combat the immense pressure of thousands of tons of flesh, mining and research crews use giant mining rigs to keep the flesh from collapsing. These high-tech flesh submarines are huge machines almost as big as a neighborhood street, bristling with tools and racks and sensors and floodlights that cauterize their way through the pit. They were the only lifeline and safe space for these miners on their three-month-long expeditions. Miners had to wear fully insulated suits of protective gear, including air supplies, because deeper in the air is unbreathable. Every moment in the depths of the pit is deeply unsettling. According to one miner, working down there isn't like working in a cave or a mine. Everything is wet, slippery, disgusting, and miserable. Nothing is flat or walkable, and you have to fight the feeling of raw, animalistic terror every moment you're out in it. Men weren't meant to be down there in the innards of a monster, but I figure that's why the company pays people what they do. And men truly weren't. Most of the miners had some sort of permanent injury, lost figures, blown shoulders or knees. Many men died in the pit too far away from medical response to help. So if the mystery flesh pit is so inherently hostile and dangerous, why did Anodyne purchase it? Why did they open a theme park, and why do mining operations continue to this day? The answer is simple. Capitalism and money. The minerals and materials mined from the pit helped catapult Anodyne to one of the top 20 corporations in the world. And because of the otherworldly materials that could only be found inside of the Permian Basin superorganism, Anodyne had the monopoly. Aside from the profit of running a theme park, Anodyne had a hand in pharmaceuticals and constructions. One of their best sellers was a product called Refined Amniotic Ballast. This pit fluid was allegedly used to cure a range of ailments ranging from general malaise, mental degradation due to aging, to the growth of several carcinogenic tumors. It was in practically everything Anodyne sold. The amniotic ballast was also reportedly mildly and pleasantly psychotropic. When consumed recreationally, it was hallucinogenic. Also, at some point, they, they put it in a Coke flavor, which, considering Coke's origins, you know, cocaine, isn't particularly shocking. Bathing and soaking in the amniotic ballast was a known aphrodisiac, so you can imagine that the Mystery Flesh Pit Springs were a particularly sought-after honeymoon location. While amniotic ballast was the big moneymaker, it wasn't the only thing harvested by Anodyne's miners. Oscurolite, or black bone as it was known, is the carbon-based bone structure of the pit. These were the colossal natural supports that gave the Permian Basin superorganism its structure. 
Carbon-based and pitch black, black bone was used in many construction products for its strength to weight ratio. Another unique mineral to the pit was corpusite, or huge pearls of perfectly spherical mineral deposits used in optics and computers. Stripping the pit of its minerals catapulted Anodyne to one of the top 20 corporations in the world. And in their defense, they did add safety measures and fail-safes to keep visitors, miners, and park workers safe. In addition to the minor, standard safety measures, there were four main fail-safes implemented by Anodyne and the US government that are in place for dangerous movement of the flesh pit. The first of these are called dilation anchors, mechanical arms that keep the entry orifice open. These retract in case of an emergency, pinning the maw open and allowing rescue operations inside the mystery flesh pit. The second of these are aconitine injections, or a poison slash sedative injection to slow down the pit. Aconitine is commonly used as an acute toxin for large mammals such as whales and was chosen by anodyne for its theoretical effectiveness on key muscle groups within the organism. Basically, if the organism started moving, the aconitine was supposed to stop that. Option three is a device simply known as the contingency measure. A device made of giant spinning quartz crystals, crystals that produced a strange harmonic frequency that irritated or damaged the pit. Although not stated from where they came, the contingency measure was made of excavated massive quartz crystals known as Mystic Artifacts 15, 21, and 22. As far as I could ascertain, there's no further explanation for where they come from or how they exactly they came into being. Not a lot is known about them, but they did have a tangible effect on the pit. Which leads us to the fourth option, the nuclear option. Ambulatory nukes are the most dangerous and perhaps most ineffective of the countermeasures. Should the flesh pit ever become ambulatory, should it ever drag itself out of the pit and start walking like it did thousands of years ago, the United States government has authorized nuclear force to keep it away from population centers. This is despite the multiple studies ascertaining that this would be ultimately ineffective. For every poison injection and mystical crystal safety measure, there was also more mundane ones. Stints in climate controlled suits for the miners, auto leveling supports for the visitor center, pumps to prevent flooding, backup generators, and armed rangers. On paper, Anodyne has accounted for most, if not all, of the safety issues that could occur. However, just like any self-respecting massive corporation, Anodyne's involvement led to nothing but shortcuts and pain. Which brings us to the incident on the night of July 4th, 2007. I'm going to lay out the timeline of the incident, slightly abridged for time, and then go into the findings of the US government's 2007 disaster report. For those of you who want the full text, I've linked it down below, and for those of you who don't, let's begin with the incident timeline. Howdy folks, we're about halfway through the video. If you've watched it this far, you're probably enjoying it, so why don't you consider subscribing? It means a lot and it really helps out the channel, all right? Let's get back into it. July 4th, 1029 AM. Unreasonably high rains force park administrators to cancel a July 4th concert. Visitors are upset and the decision is made to extend the park hours until midnight for those who had purchased event tickets. For those of you who grew up in the south or in similarly dry areas, you would know that when torrential rain occurs after dry periods, it doesn't soak into the ground because the ground itself is too dry. The rain instead runs off, causing flash floods and mudslides. And in 2007, Texas was in the very beginning of a two year drought. Pair this with an unexpected torrential rain and you have a recipe for disaster. At 9.30 p.m., control room operators discovered a relay fault error that resulted from increased electrical demand on the mining equipment and tourist infrastructure. At 9.41, water drains from the surface rain into the entry orifice and begins to collect in the sand gullet. The drainage pumps are, are automatically activated but fail to initialize due to the relay fault. An emergency backup pump is automatically activated. At 9.42, an alarm alerts the control room operators that the emergency water pump has ceased and has failed. Lack of maintenance and pit corrosiveness has led to a breakdown on the impeller due to the moist interior of the flesh pit environment. There's two environments that cause more degradation and corrosion than any other, wet ones and salty ones. So it's no surprise that the pit's already caustic environment made of hydrochloric acid can lead to problems, especially if preventative maintenance does not occur. And knowing anodyne, it didn't. At 9.48 p.m., technicians arrive at the primary pump station to discover that the sand gullet is almost completely submerged. Water begins to pour over the dorsal respiratory ridge and into the bronchial tubes. 
Control room operators divert power to hydraulic stent rams to brace for the expected choke response. Basically, the pit is drowning itself and they're bracing for choking from that. At 9.51, technicians repair the relay fault as the control staff reset the park's electrical grid. The temporary lapse in lighting causes many guests to become panicked and return to the main elevator at the lower visitor center. The grid is offline for 45 seconds. At 9.52 p.m., a choking action from the organism begins 31 seconds into the electrical reset. The main dorsal trunk violently flexes. Lack of power to the hydraulic arming rams causes irreparable damage to several sections of internal infrastructure. Basically, the pit is so massive that any movement breaks man-made things like the visitor center supports. At 9.53, the electrical system reboots and the dynamic hydraulic actuators supporting the lower visitor center overcorrect for stability, not accounting for the shifting of the walls. Two of the six structural supports are torn from their foundations, which causes the facility to list. The base joint of the vertical entry gantry is bent far beyond its design limit angle. At 9.54 p.m., the master alarm is tripped automatically. Park rangers are dispatched to rescue groups of visitors trapped in partially collapsed tunnels and trails. At 10.03 p.m., continued movement of the organism combined with rainwater causes one of the entry gantry supports to slip. An outbound elevator conducts an emergency stop, stranding over two dozen visitors. At 10.05 p.m., tremors are registered as far away as the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. At 10.06, soil liquefaction destabilizes surface facilities in and around the organisms. The dilation anchors begin retracting to keep the entry orifice open. At 10.12, a master failsafe is activated by the automated park management system. 20,000 liters of aconitine compound are injected into the superorganism via the distributed network of relay stations located throughout its known internal anatomy. At 10.12 p.m., tremors and convulsions intensify. The lower visitor center begins to collapse downwards into the nexial cavity and begins to be crushed by the muscle. At 10.15 p.m., a junction just west of the Septum Falls geobiological feature flexes into an open position, releasing a torrent of lactogastric chyma, basically stomach acid, into the dorsal trunk. It is likely that this was a reaction to the aconitine injection. At 10.16, peristaltic spasms force the chyma slurry through the nexial cavity and up towards the surface orifice. At 10.16, guests attempt to flee the stalled elevator entry near the orifice by climbing out, but are unsuccessful due to torrential rains causing the surfaces to become very slippery. Many end up falling back into the maw. I don't know if you've ever tried climbing a wet or muddy surface, but it's basically impossible without proper equipment. The tourists basically stood no chance. At 10.17 p.m., the chyma slurry erupts from the surface orifice in a geyser several hundred meters in height. After the several minute long ejecta event, an incredibly loud roar erupts from the pit as the ground tremors intensify further. Large extremities begin surfacing through the bedrock and soil approximately 30 to 100 kilometers from the entry orifice. The smell can be detected as far as Odessa, Texas. At 10.26 p.m., two park service vehicles and a tour vehicle containing several guests attempt to ascend through the entry orifice tube. Peristaltic action, or swallowing, crushes one of the tour vehicles, and the other two vehicles are sucked back into a digestive organ of the pit. These vehicles are presumed destroyed. 10.58 p.m. The Pentagon is given authorization from the White House to use nuclear force if necessary to prevent the organism from entering a active or ambulatory state. Remember, studies have shown that nukes won't work. Once again, the government refuses to listen to science. At 11.02 p.m. on July 4th, the on-site operations director within the lower visitor center control room initiates the final failsafe measure. He initiates the contingency measure. At 11.05, the lower visitor center's structural integrity is critically compromised, resulting in total collapse. Contact and data connection with the lower visitor center is severed. 11.13 p.m. July 4th. Spasms and motor action of the superorganism begins to noticeably subside, possibly because of the contingency measure. Response teams begin to descend into the surface orifice to attempt rescue operations. At 11.19, the response team encounters the visitor group which had attempted to escape from the stalled elevator. Most are dead and the remainder are mortally wounded and partially digested due to the caustic gastric ejecta. It is likely that the early forms of some human amalgamations were present there. The scene must have been horrifying. 
At 11.42, radio contact is established with the Ranger vehicle trapped within the Oyster Shane. Due to ventricle closure, no feasible rescue strategy can be developed before complete mastication occurs. For those of you who aren't aware, mastication means chewing. <laughs> it is now past midnight and is the early morning of July 5th. At 12.35 a.m. on July 5th, three inner pit life forms, likely abyssal copepods, are identified as being ejected to the surface. Fifteen visitors are injured and seven more are hunted by the inner pit life forms during a panicked evacuation of the surface resort. Park staff managed to finally kill the three large life forms at 1241. At 1.58 a.m., a field hospital has been constructed to care for wounded visitors and staff. The National Guard is mobilized and is on site. At 2.37 a.m., initial damage surveys report catastrophic destruction of internal park infrastructure. The pit biology has dramatically changed in hazard level. At 4.39 a.m., base camp technicians begin to spin down the contingency measure. Large fractures due to the inertial stress have appeared on the quartz crystals. Engineers advise against reinitializing the contingency measure until the mineral components can be replaced or repaired. At 6.08 a.m., ground personnel begin assembling a pump system to inject industrial sedatives into the superorganism. Transport trucks containing industrial sedative arrived, but are eventually not used. At 11.20 a.m. on July 5th, several injured visitors inexplicably leave the field hospital and begin to walk back towards the open pit orifice. Approximately 38 individuals are able to crawl back into the orifice over the course of 8 hours. None are recovered. It is unknown why these people started heading back to the pit, but it was likely a shock response to the trauma, perhaps a desire to rescue their friends or family still in the pit. But whatever the case, we don't know the true reason. At 3.51 p.m., a radio transmission from the trapped ranger vehicle ceases. Many speculate that other small groups of staff and visitors remain trapped. This is the end of the relative timeline. The final casualty report is this. Over 750 people died due to this accident, and over 1,800 people were injured. An incident of this size was naturally investigated by everyone under the sun, but the one report we have access to is the 2007 disaster report by the U.S. Commission on Geobiological Resources and Public Safety. There's a lot of technical jargon in the report, but it mostly boils down to this. Multiple decisions made by Anodyne Inc. were found to be faulty. Every part that failed, such as the pump impeller, the electrical systems, and the support structures were recommended to be inspected and the recommendation was ignored by park management. More importantly, the use of a previously untested contingency measure by operators, while not the primary inciting incident of the disaster, was a prime contributor to the outstanding collateral damage. The untested aconitine injections caused significantly more harm than good. Convulsions caused by the injections resulted in the loss of the visitor center, the elevator, and the digestion and amalgamation of nearly 750 visitors and staff. It is also the main driving factor behind the gastric ejecta event. In addition, the mystic spinning quartz contingency measure was untested and poorly communicated, leading to damage rendering it inoperable. Anodyne did not follow internal recommendations to help prevent structural failures to hydrochloric corrosion. In the eight years prior to the incident, a small number of anodyne personnel with knowledge and understanding of venterio biology recommended on several occasions either a one-time inspection of every component within the primary park infrastructure or an upgrade to the components. The recommendations were not implemented effectively, and many key structural and, me and mechanical components remained in service until the failure on July 4th, 2007. Anodyne's safety culture was fundamentally flawed and directly led to this accident. They were removed from pit management and went bankrupt, but were bailed out by the Department of Interior, likely because of lobbying and corruption, and ended up back in charge of the pit. They are still in charge of it to this day. As for the pit itself, it remains closed to the public. However, mining still occurs in small-scale operations. Efforts are constantly in place to prevent a hunger response from the superorganism. The Permian Basin superorganism has calmed, but an influx of nutrients from digested visitors and discomfort from the injections continue to this day in the form of frequent tremors. The main worry is that Amanus Colossus will drag itself out of the pit and go on a rampage across the southern United States. If that happens, there is nothing we can do. This is a direct quote from the disaster report. Concerning the survivability of a societal encounter with an active and ambulatory Amanus Colosseus, 
It is unrealistic to believe that mankind will be able to seriously damage or eliminate such an organism. Basically, we can only hope and pray that it stays in the pit. That would of course be if the mystery flesh pit was actually real, because it's not. It's the online world building project created by an artist named Trevor Roberts. All the illustrations and graphics and more were created by him, but isn't it fucking cool though? Folks, this has been Unraveling Mystery Flesh Pit National Park. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see a video on a real mystery, you can check out this video right here. If you want to help support the channel, you can subscribe, and I will catch you on the flip side. Later!